let's say we have a function f of x, um, which gives us the value of y, which means that for any x from whatever the range of x is legal for this function, we get some specific value of y. But sometimes we like to know the opposite. We want to give y and we want to get x. To do that, we have to have another function that relate y to x. And this function is going to be called inverse function function f. Sometimes this function is denoted as f with superscript minus 1. But we will continue to use the g notation in this particular case. Let's say we have a function f and function g. Um, we take the derivative of both functions. And the question will be, can we relate them? Okay, we know obviously the functions are related, but can we specify how the derivatives of these functions related to each other? And that's what is going to be our goal. Well, we start with definition of the derivative for function f. We're going to call this derivative as dy dx. And that's really the difference in the function f between points x plus delta x and point x divided by delta x when delta x goes to 0. So let's define delta y as the difference in function f between points x plus delta x and x. Now, if we look here, we see that we use the term y for f of x. So if you plug y here instead of x and move that y to the other side, to the left-hand side, we're going to have expression like this. But if y plus delta y equals f of x plus delta x, that means that x plus delta x should be equal to g of y plus delta y, if g is inverse function of f. Now, in this particular case, we can use this formula and remember that x is g of y, plug it here and move to the right-hand side, and we're going to get delta x as g of y plus delta y minus g of y. And now let's rewrite our derivative dy dx as a ratio of delta y delta x when delta x goes to 0. Now if you look at this ratio, delta y to delta x, it's obvious that this ratio should be equal as 1 over delta x over delta y. And our derivative dy dx should be the limit of that expression. Since 1 doesn't depend on delta x, we can rewrite it as 1 over the limit of the delta x over delta y when delta x goes to 0. Now let's look at this limit in a little bit more details. Well, we know that delta x, as we found out before, is g of y plus delta y minus g of y divided by delta y, and we need to take delta x to 0. It looks like almost like derivative of g, except for the limit is taken for when delta x goes to 0, not delta y goes to 0. But let's investigate and see what's going to happen to delta y when delta x goes to 0. And if you look here, we'll see that when delta x goes to 0, what, what I'm going to have here is f of x minus f of x, which is 0. Which means that when delta x goes to 0, delta y also goes to 0. And we can rewrite this limit this way, and that's really a derivative of g with respect to y, with respect to its own argument. And we're going to write it as dx dy. Now if we compare this formula and this formula, we find that dy dx equals 1 over dx dy, which seems to be obvious now. 
or in another way we can write this df dx equals 1 over dg dy. So it turned out that the relationship between the derivatives of a function and inverse function is pretty simple, pretty straightforward. So now let's rewrite this formula and let's use it to uh, find derivative of several functions. First, let's start with something simple like square root of x. We already found the derivative of square root of x previously a couple of times. Well, let's just use this function one more time and find it in one more way. So if y equals square root of x, inverse function will be y squared. We know the derivative of the inverse function and that is 2y and y is square root of x so that derivative is 2 squared of x and we know that derivative of y with respect to x, derivative of square root, is 1 over this expression and here's our answer. Pretty simple. In my opinion, this is probably the fastest and simplest way to derive this formula. Let's consider another example. In this case, we're going to deal with natural logarithm of x. Well, if y is natural logarithm of x, x is e to the power of y. Well, the derivative of exponential is a very interesting thing. It's actually equal to the function itself. And now, if you look at the formula above, you find that the derivative of logarithm is 1 over x. Pretty simple. Now let's look at more complicated cases. Let's look at the derivatives of inverse functions, inverse trigonomic functions. So the first one will be um, inverse sine. There are two ways to write inverse sine. It's sine with superscript minus 1. And another notation is arc sine. I do not like notation with superscript of minus 1. To me, it's confusing because you can look at it and think that we're talking about sine to the power of minus 1. So I will use notation arc sine. Um, if y equals arc sine x, y has to be in the range of minus pi over 2 to pi over 2. That's a property of arc sine. And also if y equals to arc sine x, it means that x equal to sine y. Derivative of sine is cosine. And uh, dy dx, derivative of arc sine, is 1 over cosine y. Now we got this derivative via y, but really we would like to get the derivative with respect to x because the function itself is a function of x. So what we need to do, we need to find cosine y when we know sine y. Sine y is x, so we need to find cosine if we know sine. That's not that difficult. First of all, we need to remember that sine squared plus cosine squared equals to 1 for any value of y. And from that expression, we can express cosine squared y via sine squared. And since sine is x, we get cosine squared y is 1 minus x squared. And cosine itself will be plus or minus square root of 1 minus x squared. Now the question is which sign should we choose, plus or minus? And to answer this question we need to find the, the range of y. Well, we already know that. y changes from minus pi over 2 to pi over 2. And luckily for us, in that particular range, cosine is non-negative. It means that we should keep the plus sign. And the derivative of arc sine is 1 over square root of 1 minus x squared. Next, we look at inverse cosine. Again, two notations. And I'm going to use notation arc cosine. Y or arc cosine changes in the range from 0 to pi. Also, 
if y equals r cosine of x, x equals to cosine of y. Derivative of cosine is minus sine. And the derivative of r cosine is minus 1 over sine y. Again, we would like to get the answer through x, not through y. Here we know that x is cosine y, and now we need to find sine if you know cosine. Again, we start with our expression that sine squared plus cosine squared equals to 1. Find sine from that expression. Remember that cosine is x. And take a square root. Again, we get two options, plus or minus. Now we look at the values of y, which is from 0 to pi. When we do this, we realize in that range, sine is non-negative. So we keep plus sign, and the derivative of our cosine becomes 1 over this expression. And here it is. The last example we're going to look at is inverse tangent or arc tangent. Um, arc tangent changes in the range of from minus pi over 2 to pi over 2, but in this case and that's different from arc sine uh, minus pi over 2 and pi over 2 are not included in this range. If y equals to arc tangent x, x equal to tangent y, derivative of tangent is 1 over cosine squared. So derivative of arc tangent is cosine squared y. And again, we need to find cosine square y if we know tangent. Again, we start with sine square plus cosine square equals to 1. But in this case, we're going to divide this expression, both left and right hand side, by cosine square. We're going to get this expression. Now, what we see here is tangent square y. Tangent y is x. So 1 over cosine squared is x squared plus 1. And dy dx, so derivative of arctangent, is 1 over this expression. And that's it.